Welcome in, everybody. This is it. I can't believe how fast seven weeks has gone by here. But the Carbiz Chronicles wraps up today. Um, we have specifically chosen today's guest, uh, someone I follow for a long time. Watch him go from uh, both on the vendor side now into the retail side. It's been really cool to watch. If you guys don't know who he is by the end of today, you certainly will. And if you don't already follow him, you should. Everyone, welcome our closer, for lack of a better term, Mike Cavanaugh. Mike, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on today. Appreciate it. Buddy, it's, thank you. I really appreciate you agreeing to do this. And I think you'll have a, a good good opinions on where we're headed here. We've had some really great conversations with folks leading up to this week. Um, and I, I, I kind of look forward to tying those into our discussions, kind of taking those, those perspectives and mixing them in. So we'll start today as we've started all episodes here for the final show. Mike, what does culture mean to you? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. I think culture means a lot of things to me. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to, I think, grow up in the business around a lot of great cultures. Um, you know, starting in a family business with my dad, um, I would say growing up in that environment, culture really at the time to me meant caring about people, right? Caring about your customers, caring about, you know, your fellow teammates there. Um, and then from there on to the Marine Corps, you know, we had a couple of core values there were honor, courage, and commitment. And uh, a lot of people are familiar with, you know, the military and the Marines and kind of, I think there's a perceived culture there that everybody has that's oftentimes different. Uh, but really, I mean, it's, it's about the people, it's about the environment, uh, the people that you serve, the people that you serve alongside with. I mean, that's really kind of when I think about culture, that's what I think about. Mike, when you say that now, I, I like how you phrase that with the military part. I'd like to dive into that for a moment if we could uh, from a perception standpoint, right? When I think of the culture of the military, I think specific, I think strict, I think to the line, to the letter. Um, but there is got to be more to that. So can you expand a little bit on the team mentality or sort of kind of how, because I can tell by what you post that you you bring that part of your life into this part of your life. So how, from what part do you pull on the military side to sort of inject into today? Uh, good question. You know, I, I think that was a very formative time in my life. You know, I joined the Marine Corps when I was about 17 years old. So I was a puppy, man. I was a, a very young kid. and what I learned there is, you know, they break you down into really, you know, a lot of people call it brainwashing, but that's not really what it is. But they try to instill an extreme sense of humility in you at first and pretty much program you that everything you've learned to this point really doesn't matter. What we're about to teach you is what's going to, you know, keep you alive and make you a good Marine. Um, and the thing that I appreciate most about the culture there is that some of the organizations, outside of the military tend to have problems with, um, you know, people getting along, people from varying backgrounds, varying cultures getting along. But when you look at the military, you see people from uh, well-off families, people from not so well-off families. You see people of every race, color, creed that go into the Marine Corps and your brothers and your sisters, right? Like they are your true family and you would literally put your life on the line for those folks. Um, so I think when you think about that culture, aside from the strict discipline nature of it, it teaches you that, you know, to be humble and that you're all equal. You know, you all start from the same place. When you think about, you know, enlisted Marines in particular, you've got a bunch of 17, 18, 19 year old kids that come in and no matter how well off your parents were, no matter how smart you were, whether you got all A's or whether you flunked out and dropped out of high school, right? You're all even when you start and you have to earn what you get from there. And I, I think I've, I've heard the term many times and I've used it myself of, of a meritocracy is that I really started to learn a lot about the culture of a meritocracy um, in, the, in the Marine Corps. Well, see, now that's, that's the thing, right? When you, when you say that, you present it to me in such a way where uh, everyone is equal, right? They, it doesn't matter about where they're from, the background part. That's, that's really big to me because I don't think that we do that, right? When we, when we take that into automotive, Mike, when you bring in a new guy, right? You got the FNG syndrome, but that's what we all, it's a joke, but it's not. Like it can be, it can be literally super toxic and really harmful, right? We've talked about it on previous episodes, um, and so I used to go 
strict on the military. I'm not from the military. My dad was in the military, but military wise, and I'd be very strict to like have zero of it. Right. But I think there is a, a mix somewhere along the line of allowing people to be themselves but also by stating, hey, there's there's a certain number of guidelines here that we follow that, you know, even if you're the new guy, it doesn't matter. This is what you'll do. Is that again back to the process of the military? Because it's the same way they did it for the first class before you and then the classes after you, correct? So this idea of the placement and process is, is really a part of their culture. Yeah, it is a big part of the culture. And I think it's, uh, you know, you have to you have to really trust the people that you work with in certain situations, particularly in, you know, combat wartime type situations. You have to trust that person. You can't have animosity. You can't have jealousy. You can't feel like somebody's playing favorites. And um, I, I will say, you've heard the saying before, you know, rents due every day, right? Like that is really true in the Marine Corps. And I had an old staff sergeant from Georgia who used to have a saying, you know, one oh shit wipes away a thousand attaboys. And it was like every day, it doesn't matter what you did 10 years ago, what you did five years ago, what you did last month, it's what you did today because you know the consequences of making mistakes or not paying attention to detail in that environment are so critical. And when you think about the makeup of those organizations, they are you know, the vast majority of the people doing the work in those organizations are young people who may not even get hired for a regular job or a job selling cars or a job in a service department because they're so young and they have no experience, right? That is what the bulk of those organizations in the military are made up of are, are young individuals. Yeah, and that's the thing. You bring up a great point, guys. I hope everyone heard that. This is not a wartime situation. Uh, so it should be easier for us to adapt and adopt culture change because we are not in that situation. We need to easily trust each other because it's the right thing to do, right? Mike says it, but you have to trust people because they're in war. And so there's no other way I would ever want to go into a scenario. And again, I don't really like the comparison of, hey, we're at the dealership and it's war. I, I kind of I kind of liken it to this. It's not though. It should never be that way. You should never be at war with a customer. You should never be at war with anyone in your dealership. So I have heard the terminology and guys, if we could just it's not that. Mike has done it. Mike has been a part of it. It's not, this is not more, this is selling cars. This is commerce, retail. Uh, Mike, when you look at the way your, your culture in, in what you think of with your part of retail, how you operate today, what, what is the most important thing for you to really get across to folks who are new to your organization that come aboard from your culture perspective? What are, what are the highlights from Mike to a new person? Well, so I'm a, I'm a big believer in core values. And I think that the people that we hire, the people that we bring on have to live our core values uh, in order to be a good fit in the organization, in order to earn the right to serve our customers. And, you know, one of our core values and our very first core value is to earn customers for life. And the thing that is critically important about the culture and about that particular value of ours is that, and I, and I say this all the time, is that every single thing you do either gets you closer to earning a customer for life or it gets you further away every interaction, but you never really stay net the same. You're either doing something that makes that customer want to come back and do business with you, that whether that's servicing a car, whether that's selling you a car, whether that's buying their next car from you, or it gets them further away where they say, maybe I'll just go someplace else. There's some place that's closer to service my car Carvana will come pick up my car from my driveway. Maybe I'll just sell it to them versus thinking that, you know, Mike or Sean is my, is my guy. And I want to do business with him because he's earned my trust. He's earned my respect. And I want to do business with him again. And I think that's why it's so crucial right now for salespeople in general, or people who have their own opportunity to have sales opportunities, right? Or customers that you, you treat it as that. Like I used to tell my customers, do you need service? Call me. Well, Sean, we'll just call service. No, call me. I'll schedule service for you. I'll take care of that. I want to be everything you step foot in this dealership. I want you to go through me so that we're doing that. Um, this, this concept of closer or further away is excellent, Mike. Where did that, where did that start for you? And is it, is it something that you've focused on for a long time? Is it pretty new to you? Like I, that's the first time I'm hearing it said, right? And I, I really like it. So talk to me a little bit more about that. 
You know, I, I really learned that as a young kid from my dad. I mean, my dad grew up as a mechanic. Um, and when I was a kid, you know, he was buying and selling cars in our front yard and went on to be a very successful business guy as I got, you know, older throughout my life. Uh, but, you know, when we were working together, if my dad would sell a car to somebody and let's just say they needed help with a down payment, he would borrow them money if they needed it. And some, most of the time they'd pay him back. Sometimes they wouldn't. If he sold somebody that had, you know, income issues, right, that they were uh, challenged in terms of financially, if their car broke down and it was a 130,000 mile used car, right, and the car broke down and he sold it as is, he would help them out. If he had to stay late and take off his nice clothes and put on some coveralls and fix the car himself, he would help them out, right? So I think learning that firsthand from who my dad is, in my opinion, is one of the most, you know, humble uh, servants that you could imagine in the car business. So I learned a lot of good habits from him, I think that carried on in my own career. And when I got out of the Marine Corps, and I went into selling cars myself, I tried to live that and I was, you know, a pretty consistent 35 to 40 car a month guy. And I did business with a lot of folks in Detroit, in uh, low income neighborhoods, a lot of folks with bad credit, and I treated everybody like they had a million dollars and they could buy whatever they wanted to. And I had endless referrals from people. I had people come back and buy cars from me all the time. I had people use me as references when they bought their next car someplace else when I got out of the car business and it was a dealer friend of mine. They said, can you believe they used you as a reference, right? Like they thought that like, this guy could help me get a car. That's how much of an impression you made on him. So I think it's since I was a kid, I've just lived this. And I think it's part of our values where I'm at right now as well is to earn customers for life. But I think oftentimes we can forget about how important all the details are, right? That calling somebody back quickly, answering the phone quickly, right? Responding to a text if it's late. All of that stuff is either going to impress somebody or you're going to be just like everybody else, or they're going to feel ignored, but everything matters. You are fortunate, Mike, to have, you know, I, I, I grew up the same way, Midwest, hardworking parents. My mom's an entrepreneur, hairstylist my whole life. So you watch, you watch your parents go and work hard and do that part of it, right? It makes it easier for us to sort of adapt and see how we can be successful. And just like you, uh, same way, man, I just sold a good number of cars a month and did it by just making everyone feel like they were number one no matter what, right? Before I sold cars, I sold men's suits. I worked for the men's warehouse. Best training, best culture I've ever seen in a corporation in my life, uh, ever. It was, it was specific. It was always the same and it taught you the simple things, right? And that's what I really enjoy about life sometimes is how if we just look at the simplest format, which in this case, earning a customer for life, you didn't say anything that sounded obnoxious to me. Respond to a text timely fashion. Be on an email. Uh, speak like a human if you're on the phone, you know, pick up the phone in a timely manner. These aren't things that need, you know, master's degrees, people. This is really, this is something that we can all do together. Mike, with culture being a buzzword right now, as it is, it's everywhere. Um, what do you think are some of the pitfalls to people looking at their own culture? What are, what are some of the blind spots you think may exist in that world? Because I know you sit up atop a, 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 a larger group of people, you have a little bit different view. What, what are some of the blind spots folks should look out for within culture that they may not want to say to themselves? It's another good question. Um, I think a lot of times our culture, our values can be very intrinsically focused when a lot of times they need to be focused on the customer and serving the customer. Uh, that's why I, I really love uh, the organization that I'm with right now is because the customer is at the, at the heart of everything we do. Um, even if it makes it harder on us or it makes us think harder or challenge ourselves with creating a process that's not the same as status quo, that the customer has to be at the heart of all you do. And that doesn't mean that, you know, the customer is always right. That doesn't mean that your employees and your team members are not important, but it means we design everything we do around serving other people. And I think that that is contagious um, I also am a big fan of the, the concept of the, you know, the inverted triangle, right, where typically we think of an organization and it's hierarchical and we think about it going down right from a CEO on down to the, you know, the frontline workers at the bottom and really it's, it's the opposite, right, where your customers are at the top and you as the most senior leader in the organization is at the bottom and it's your job to push these things up through your organization and make their way to the customer and I think 
whether any kind of change management, but especially if you're trying to establish a culture or reestablish a culture at an organization, the amount of time, effort, energy, work that's necessary by the most senior leaders in the organization to establish a culture is probably one of the biggest blind spots that I've seen with many organizations is that it can't just be part of the new hire onboarding package. It can't just be you know decals that you slap up on a wall in a hallway. It has to be part about part of how you talk about everything every day, part of, of how you performance manage and coach people when there's an opportunity, right? Well, you can use an example, like I mentioned earlier and say, let me ask you a question. You know, that interaction you just had with the customer, do you think that got you closer to earning a customer for life or further away? It helps reinforce it and program it into people's minds, right? Another one of our values is to take personal ownership. You know, when you start to think about again, that coaching opportunity with any team member, right, is, hey, do you think you took personal ownership with that? Or are you trying to place the blame on somebody else? You start to establish this culture. And I kind of think about it like an operating system on a computer, right, or on a phone, is you establish your culture, your values as your operating system, the lens at which you look at everything through, the lens at which you performance, manage people, coach people, develop people, treat customers, right, hire people, deciding to bring, bring people in your organization, they either are going to be a good fit and part of the culture and help you advance your mission or they're, or they're not going to be. Um, I'm sure many folks in the automotive industry or any industry have been a part of a situation where that's old saying, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. You know, like when you bring somebody in that does not fit your values and does not align with your culture, they can create chaos for an extended period of time. They can hurt your relationships with your customers. They can make other employees leave. They can cost you money. Um, so I, I really think that that's you know critical as a part of an organization is a, a strong established culture. Yeah, and you you speak to a um, a good part of what to what's been a common thread I think throughout the last six discussions, uh, which is this idea that it has to be more than than decals and conversation. It has to be it has to be action. It has to be people who are seeing it being done in front of them, right? And I always pride myself when I was a leader of an organization to make sure that whatever I asked you to do, I did. That's how I came up through the car business. I started by washing cars and then I made myself into sales and, 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 on, and on from there. But the point is, is that you always, you never forget that. So I was always checking in on every department as daily as possible, you know, just how are we, what's up? Mike, We've been talking a lot about mental health as it relates to just in, in people, but in our business, how do you guys at your place or how do you view personally, I guess, more fairly, how do you view the mental health aspect of jobs now, right? Because when you and I would have started in the car business, right, mental health, things like that, sick days, days off, you know, frowned upon, yelled at, sometimes fireable offenses, uh, is no longer the case. So how do you see mental health tying into culture today? That's It's critical, right? Taking time for mental health, physical health, spiritual health, right? All of those things help align people and, and gain balance in their life and help them operate at peak performance. You know, I read a ton. I read probably at least a book a week. And when you read books like Relentless or Winning by a Tim Grover, and you see how important that you know, focusing on your overall health, mental health, not just physical conditioning was to folks like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, you know, you realize that, you know, while this isn't wartime and while this isn't, you know, competitive professional sports, I've always been a believer that whatever you choose your profession to be, you have to take it seriously and, and really say, how do I operate at peak performance? And I believe mental health is truly a critical piece of that, right? So taking time to sharpen the saw, right? Whether that's taking time to read, whether that's knowing when to tap out, I would have to say the car business is predominantly a male dominated industry. There's a lot of, you know, bravado or macho, or I can do anything. I can shoulder the load. I can take on more. I don't have to take days off. I can work longer than anybody, but ultimately you're doing yourself, your team members, your company, your customers a disservice. If you let yourself get dull because you know you get irritable, you start to lose your patience with people. You know, even even the most cool, calm, collected leader, if they don't take time for mental health, they're they're going to do things that they wouldn't do when they're in the zone, so to speak, right? So I think mental health is is critical to anybody, to any human being, even if you're working from home. Mental health is critical. 
Yeah, I, I agree, man. I, uh, I was in a room once uh, with Tim Grover, a uh, client of mine in Chicago. That's his personal trainer. Uh, and it was, I didn't speak to him. I don't even know if he knew I was in the room. But just, just the, the, the energy that this dude gave off, the, the, like, when he left the room, I, I, just, I asked my client, I'm like, I'm sorry, man. Who the hell was that? I have no idea. Uh, not a big reader on my end, not helpful. But so, so I, who is that? He said, Sean, this, you don't know who that is. It's Tim Grover. How do you not know? It's Michael Jordan. It's this, it's that. I'm like, yeah, I didn't know that. I said, but man, his aura, his just, his human. He said, that's how he does everything in his life, Sean. Everything in his life is 110%. It never stops. He goes, that's why he's my trainer. And my, my particular client, this guy was down like 110 pounds. I mean, it was, it was a nuts transformation. He gives 130% of credit to, uh, to Tim. So I, I completely understand that part of it being just crazy about it. But you talk about the, uh, the male bravado and I, you know, the machismo stuff. And I get, I get really tired of it. I get, I'm tired of hearing it. We need more females. We talk about it all the time. But but go back to the celebration of well, that's what I call the celebration of the 70 hour work week, Mike. Um, we, we, you, it sounds like you agree. We do not need this sort of celebration anymore. You it's, you don't need to work 70 hours to get, to get everything done to prove a point in the car business anymore. Is that, is that fair to say, Mike? Yeah, I would agree. I don't think it's about how long you work or when you come in and when you leave. I think it's about the results that you get. And uh, I think there's a balance, right? And oftentimes people hear the convenient truth when, when somebody's talking, some industry expert, some guru, some author talks, they hear the convenient truth and they think that that might mean that I should never work more than 40 hours or I don't have to put in the time. Work-life balance means that I, I barely work and I have all this life to spend, right? Yeah. And I will say that I've learned about work-life balance over time, uh, but I like I love what I do every day and I love to work but I find ways to balance that over time. And I think somebody that's young and coming up in their career and trying to make a name for themselves, you know, you may not have that perfect balance right out of the gate where you can do whatever you want. And you have, you know, I work 25 hours and, you know, I'm so successful and I make all this money. You have to put in the time first before you get there. Right. That's how you get to that balance. So I think if you look at the whole picture holistically, it's like, there's going to be times in your career where you're going to work way more than you have free time. And there's going to be times in your career where you've built a great team and you've got other leaders on your team that you can trust and you can walk away from a week and go on vacation to the Caribbean and everything functions perfectly and you come back and it's great. And there's other times when you're building a team or you're building a business from scratch where you don't get very much time away at all, but you've got to earn the right. And I had a, a former a mentor of mine who used to say, you know, you need to earn the right to be left alone. You're going to be micromanaged at first. We're going to make sure that we're aligned and you're doing everything as expected. And then you earn the right to be left alone. And I think you also earn the right to have a work-life balance, you know, or more of a balance if you want to excel in your career. I Yes, a hundred percent. Yes. You know, I'm, uh, we're in year, let's see, this will be year nine of our company coming up. And, you know, started it from scratch and, and it was hard in the beginning. And now as I've gotten older with the company and myself in age, I've noticed that as long as, as I do the work when it finds me, as opposed to going to work, look for it, right? So if you're, if you have downtime, just try to lean into it, try to accept it, try to sit down. I mean, Mike, I'm sure like you, there's an, actually, you know what, I'm sure our, our calendars are not even comparable, but my calendar looks a little wild. You know what I mean? And if you look at it, you're like, there's a lot of shit going on today, man. We got a lot of things. But if there's that hour, don't feel the need to fill it. Feel the need to take it and, and, and really just kind of recoup. You know, uh, I'll never forget my now business partner. He's been, he and I have been friends since we were 13 years old. Um, he was talking to me. I was 25 years old. I was down at the end of a stint for one of my dealers that I was working retail for. And I was talking to him while I was helping them out. And I was in a hotel room. And he said, man, you sound burned out. He said, you're 25 years old. I thought, oh, do I really sound that way? He says, dude, you, you sound like you have nothing left. And I felt that way, but I didn't really say it out loud. I didn't really think about it, Mike. Um, but mental health and really trying to dial into it helped me understand that. So uh, for you and, and with you as being a, a leader, how often do you try to have those check-ins or communications or leave the door open about mental health? with people, Mike, because I know it's not easy in our business. So how do you go about letting the people who work with you and for you know that, hey, Mike is here to, to, to be that ear if need be? 
I would say very frequently if, if, you know, monthly, if not more, I mean, I, I live personally by three, three kind of personal values that my interactions with everybody, I try and I fall short sometimes, but I try to have patience, kindness, and grace with everybody that I work with. Right. And patience means, you know, taking your time to help, help listen to them and understand what may be creating a problem. And sometimes when you take the time to be patient and listen to somebody, you find out that there's other things going on outside of work that they need to handle, that they need to take time for, or that they aren't feeling healthy and they need more time to exercise, right? But like, rather than just saying, hey, I've got a a one-on-one with somebody and I've got to have my, you know, performance review, it's really just scheduling time to make sure you're checking in with people to see how they're doing, right? Because it may not be, you know, I don't know what to do, or I need more training, or everybody's favorite is I need to reiterate what the expectations are, you know, you got to hit 500 this month, right, right, like, that's everybody's favorite, but it's just like, hey, I noticed you've been a little bit off, what's going on? Oh, you know what, I'm having some problems at home, or I just feel like I'm a little bit burnt out, I'm not in the zone, okay, tell me a little bit more about it, ask some questions, right, but I don't think that this is like a robotic thing that, you know, you've got your script of questions that you ask for from somebody. I think you genuinely have to care about people, right? Like you have to genuinely care about people and not make it like a checklist of, you know, how's somebody doing with their mental health, right? But just check yourself a little bit and say, do I actually care about people? And do I want them to have a a work-life balance? Do I want them to be a good husband, a good father, a good wife, a good mother, do I, or do I might just want to demand everything I can squeeze out of that human being for my own selfish motivation, right? And I think when you reflect on that, sometimes that's really what you're asking somebody to do. If I want you to work 100 hours a week, every single week and have no days off, and I don't care if you get divorced, or I don't care if your kids hate your guts, as long as you're selling cars, I, I got to feel good about what I do every day. And if I don't feel good about what I do and how I treat people, I can't sleep good at night. Yeah. And, and again, it, it, that's where you get the, the, the toxic negative culture, right? So, I mean, as long as we have left to exist as, as dealers and as, as people who have the service of selling cars and being responsible for sometimes the number one purchase in people's lives, you know, we, we've so routinely called it the second, but the reality is it's probably the first for more people than I think actually even we give it credit for. Um, and it's important and it's a big part. And that's what I love. I love being a part of that. When you talked earlier about being a reference, man, I had customers who'd invite me to kids' birthdays. You know what I mean? Just because you sold them the family van that the the kids got around in, you know? And and they come to service and you play with the kid or whatever, because that's the connection that matters to me. Um, I'm actually, as I get older, I'm probably more, I don't know, I guess I call it antisocial. Like, I love all of this. I love what I do. But when it comes time to, like, not be on the camera or not be doing work, it's just me and my wife. Like I don't have kids. So I'm out in nature. I hike a lot. I'm always doing that. Um, and I try to connect there. Mike, what do you do to, to sort of, you know, ground yourself, bring yourself to center with as much travel and craziness you got going on in your life? What are some tips you have for folks in the world to just kind of bring it, bring it back down a notch and just sort of level out? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I am a big fan of exercise. I work out every single day, seven days a week, um, unless I'm sick or something, right. Then I, then I, I don't, sometimes I even do, but physical health is incredibly important to me. I've had times in my life where I've probably been about 25 pounds heavier than I am right now. And when you, uh, you know, lift up two bowling balls and you say, wow, I was carrying this around extra, you realize why you felt like crap and why, why you weren't operating at peak performance. And so I've, I've always tried to have the discipline uh, to stay healthy from an exercise standpoint. I love food. I love to eat, um, you know, healthy things, unhealthy things. I love food, man. So I also have to exercise because I, I eat enough to be unhealthy really fast if I don't. Um, that, and I would say, uh, reading, reading helps me sharpen the saw, helps me focus. That's why I love to read, um, at night before I go to bed, if I'm on an airplane, I like to read. Um, so I'd say exercise reading. I'm a very spiritual person. I take, take time for myself in that, that realm as well, too, to help keep myself centered, keep myself humble and be grateful for all the blessings that I do have in my life. Because, uh, I think there's a lot of people that work hard. There's a lot of people that are talented, but uh, I feel very fortunate and very blessed every day for the life that I have. Man, I could agree with you more. The, the three principles of Mike is what I'm going to call 
follow him here. The patience, kindness, um, and is graceful. Is that right? I had that right. Patience, kindness, and grace. Yeah, that's, that's grace. My, yeah, my, right. My so, grief. Mike, let me ask you something. Patience part. Speak truly to me here, friend. How long did that really take to develop? Because it's currently where I struggle in one's life is because I see the path, right? It's just, I'm fortunate enough to have how I envision or whatever. If someone brings me a problem, I, I, I get it. I see the path, but then people will get in the middle of the path and they have their, their questions and their comments. And it's like, no, 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 the path. And we're going to go down this. So Mike, how, how can I, or how have you gotten better with patients? So I, I'm an incredibly urgent person by nature. I move very fast. I eat fast. I scarf down food, food like I'm in prison, right? Like yeah. everything I do is with urgency. Yes. So this has been a constant struggle for me for my entire life. Um, it's, it's, I have to be very intentional about being patient every day. I have to go into every conversation that I'm going to have, forcing myself to shut up. And okay, listen. so it's like a reminder, right, Mike? Like you're, you're literally like people go in and they prep what they're going to say. I don't give, I don't give a shit. I'm going to, it's going to happen. The words will come out, but I need to first prep myself on what not to say and how not to act. Um, so, so I, I'm, yeah, to hear you say it out loud kind of makes me feel better, man. I'm not going to lie to you uh, because <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really, really hard, Mike. It's because the word urgency, I like, that's another word I like to use because I'm the same way, you know, let's get it done. Someone says, let's do this. I say, yeah, let's go. They go, oh, well, no, like later. Well, why? Like you said it to do it. Let's do it now where every time allows, you know? So, so you've always dealt with this, Mike, this has been, this is even pre-military. Mike has been an urgent oh, yeah. like individual. Yes. You know, my, my parents were not in the military. My, uh, my grandfather was, my uncles were, but my dad wasn't, but my dad was very strict and expected a lot out of me as a kid. And there was no, you know, delays. It was immediate response to orders, so to speak. So I've, I've had to be urgent since I was a young man. Um, and that's naturally overflowed into my uh, character probably. But having kids has helped me be more patient uh, for sure. And I think, you know, the, the more opportunities I've had to lead larger and larger groups of people, the more I've had to be patient because, you can't do everything. When you've got hundreds or thousands of people on your team, you can't solve every problem. And I've had that, you know, there's, there's that saying proverb, right? Like if you uh, feed a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man a fish, if you feed him for a lifetime, Yeah. that takes patience to teach somebody how to fish. I love to fish. And if you've ever tried to teach somebody how to fish, it can oh. be like brain damage, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. but you, we have to look at, look at kind of business or raising kids as like teaching somebody how to fish is like, I want you to be successful, whether I'm here or not one day. Right. So I need to have patience with you to show you how to do this. And I know it's going to take 10 times longer to teach you than it is to do it for you. But if I'm really trying to serve you as, you know, a friend, somebody on my team, my child, I need to teach you and not just do it for you. And that's, that's helped me with patience as well. Yeah, man, when I first tried to do what we do today, I launched it by myself just as an individual person. I'm like, I don't need people. I don't want people. This is me. I'm the car guy. I'm the blah, 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 blah. And it, you know, it didn't fail, but it didn't succeed either. It just sort of was middling. It just, it just laid there. Right. And then I took a year off. I went to a corporation, not the best decision one's ever made, but still we learned from those decisions, but I learned a lot about what I wanted to do based on what I saw was happening in the market in that realm. And then we just, you know, we sort of, then I went after it with people and I said, I'm going to have the patience to teach people that I brought in about the business. And this company has taught me that I don't have kids, um, but this business is my kid and that's how I treat it. And I, and, and you're right. I have developed a, a level of patience over that with, with everyone, right? So our deal is we deal with vendors for dealers on their behalf and all the data that comes with it. So you have to be very patient dealing with vendors. Um, as you know, having been one and having now dealing with them yourself, um, that if, if look, man, I got a high level of expectation. This is who I am. I, I try not to put on other people because I realize there's some unfairness to that, that at some level, you shouldn't have to feel the burden of what I expect from everything, but I can't get rid of it, Mike. So, so how do we balance our extreme expectation, right? Like you said, your dad, my parents, same way. Someone told you to take a trash out. You didn't say, yeah, later. 
you stopped whatever was going on and you took the trash out. So that's the immediacy. That's the, that's the right now. But, but Mike, how do you balance that part with, with getting people to be as they, they can never be as urgent as you, right? I, 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 I don't believe. So, so how do you get them to, to the level at which makes sense for you and them? I think clear, clear expectations do help with that. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Jocko as well. I've read a lot of his books, listened to his podcasts as well. And, you know, his, his uh, one book, Extreme Ownership, is something that I try to live by as well, too, where if, if somebody's failing, right, if somebody's not executing at the same pace that I would expect them to be executing at, to own that, right, to go to them and say, hey, where did I let you down here? Did I not give you clear enough expectations? And I will say, before I really embrace that concept fully, I have to really reflect and say, most of the time when people were not urgent, it was because I didn't clearly communicate what my expectations were because I, like you, were raised where urgency was part of my character and how I operated. It was part of my operating system was urgency, processing things fast. Everybody wasn't raised like that. Everybody doesn't have the same expectations. And unless I told them, hey, I need you to stop what you're doing right now. I need you to get this done and I need it done by five o'clock and I want you to come back to me and let me know that it's done. And if you run into any problems, I want you to let me know because I'm here to help you, right? And I will say, oddly enough, uh, a colleague of mine yesterday when I was in Dallas used a really good analogy about how important it is to set clear expectations with anybody, but particularly new employees. He said, look, if you send somebody to the store and you say, hey, can you go run out and get sodas for everybody, right? You'd think that that's a pretty clear expectation. Go to the store, get sodas, come back, right? He goes, but they're going to get in their car and they're going to say, did they want 7-Up or did they want Coke or did they want Dr. Pepper, right? And then maybe you said, go run and get Cokes. And they're going to get to the store and they're going to say, did you want regular Coke, Coke Zero or Diet Coke? Or maybe they're going to go to the McDonald's drive through and say, should I just get everybody drive through Cokes, Right. He's like, you have to be so clear with your expectations if you want the desired results. Otherwise, it's your fault that they didn't deliver on what you expected them to when you expected them to do it. Because in your mind, the expectation was really clear, crystal clear, right? Because it's in your own mind. But unless you communicated it effectively, it's on you that they didn't execute. Yeah. And I would agree that that's a lesson learned in marriage as well, Mike. And I'm sure you can agree to that. Um, that, that the idea of clear expectation or what I think I thought you thought I thought, right? And that's what I always joke with my wife. Are you thinking what I'm thinking or no? Um, but with that, with the clear part of expectations, I think it's helpful that people understand it. And I think that it brings it back to culture, though, where you say, hey, look, we're going to do our part to own it. If you, if you are failing, it, we're going to take ownership. Now, I got to tell you, that wasn't always the case in the car business where I worked, okay? People didn't want to take ownership for why I wasn't selling more cars. For instance, why does it take five hours to make a car deal on a Saturday? Say no, say yes. Get this customer out of my way and get me the next one. If, if you're going to require a certain number of car deals, you're going to have to execute faster on the desk than we're operating. Right. I don't know what to tell you. So then people get pissed at me. Oh, you don't want to hold gross. You don't want to do this. Well, hold on. Hold on. Our are we just paying on gross or are you putting the unit bonus out here, bro? I don't understand what we're doing because if we're holding gross, I'll bring the campsite and we'll start a bonfire. We won't go anywhere. I don't, it's fine. But if you're going to say, Sean, the bigger bonus is the kicker. If you hit 20, 30 units, we got to get through the desk faster. So clear expectations is a wonderful, wonderful takeaway. Mike, this is the last thing I want to sort of jump into because you are a senior leader and you are someone that I, I think, uh, uh, is very well respected in our industry, but but a topic that's come up amongst our female viewers and female um, folks on the show is the idea of safety in the in the, in the workplace, Mike. And and we're not talking OSHA here, my friend. We're sure. talking about people being able to be who they are. And when 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 potentially women, I don't deal with this. Okay, I don't deal with sexual harassment in the workplace, Mike. I never have. It's I. I but, but hearing women talk to me about it, right, over the last couple of weeks and the word around safety. Mike, what do you do to look at or to kind of just keep a, a cursory view of, of, of that part of the organization for you and how people can feel that way uh, in today's society? You know, I think you have to, again, set clear expectations about what's tolerated, what's not. And one thing that I, I 
reiterate constantly is, you know, our first responsibility as leaders is to make sure we have a, you know, a clean, safe work environment for people and that there is literally zero tolerance with any kind of harassment, whether you're male, whether you're female, zero tolerance with that. And unfortunately, many times in my career, we've had to part ways with people and, you know, uh, oftentimes people say, hey, I'm just joking, I'm just kidding, or this may be this and that, but I will say this, I grew up, my mom and dad both worked six, seven days a week. My mom, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, a Harvard graduate. She tried to educate herself the best she could, went on to have a very successful career, busted her butt. I have an immense amount of respect for my mom. Both my sisters are super smart. They, uh, you know, career women themselves, accomplished in their own careers. My wife uh, was a teacher, published author and illustrator, you know, photographer, super, super brilliant lady. And I've got a beautiful daughter, Bella, who's about to be five uh, in a little bit less than a month. And I think in particular to that topic, right, is how I frame this to everybody is, you know, if you wouldn't want your daughter or your wife working in that work environment, then shame on you right? Shame on you, because you have to remember that these are all somebody's son, daughter, mother, father, brother, sister that are working with you every day. And if you wouldn't subject your own family to that work environment, then shame on you, then you're not doing your job as a leader. That's a great way to put it. And again, you boil it down to the most basic sense that this was your family, if these were the people across from you at Thanksgiving dinner, how would you treat them? What would you say to them? What would be the part of it that means the most to you? Mike, on the way out, we ask everyone the same question. One piece of advice, man, that you have for people who want to change their culture, improve their culture, any of those sort of you know terms that come with culture. What's the one piece of advice right now you'd say to someone in your position of a, of a, a bird's eye view of a larger organization? How can they improve their culture just in a, in a simple step? Don't underestimate how much work you have to do yourself with communication. Um, you know, it's not just a conference call or a PowerPoint or a group, you know, phone call across the organization or a memo. It requires hard work. It requires you being a man or a woman of integrity and living those values and being an example of that culture yourself. And it requires hard decisions to remove people uh, uh, out of that organization that don't exude your values uh, and jeopardize your culture. So I would say the piece of advice is don't underestimate how much work it's going to take you personally as a leader to change your culture. And folks, you, uh, you heard it here. This is uh, about it. As real as it gets, someone who oversees a very large team of folks in the auto industry on a retail side, retail process, you know, this is this is why we had him be our closer. Mike, man, thank you so much for joining the show today. You have been absolutely, you've exceeded expectations. And I don't even know that I was that clear with you uh, about what they were in the first place, but you certainly exceeded them, man. So thank you so much for that. Uh, um, folks, you can find Mike. I see him all over LinkedIn. Mike, where else can folks find you? Just LinkedIn. I stay focused on that only. I'm not on anything else. Just LinkedIn. Me and Mike, that's it. We are we are LinkedIn for life, guys. We're there. You can find him all over the place. He's got great content. Make sure you follow it. Uh, thank you guys so much for everyone joining us this year. All the guests who came on for this year, the Chronicles, uh, everyone who watched. Thank you all so much. Have yourselves a wonderful week. Next week, I'm going to be back in the chair flying solo for the first time in a while. Uh, we're going to be talking about a little year-end review fund for the holidays. Thank you all so much. We'll see you again next week.